We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning to everyone and welcome to this session of the Dynamic Coalition Platform Responsibility. Uh, I was not able to hear the, the, the sound of the video, so I hope everyone can hear me. Just thumbs up to confirm that, yes, you can hear me, excellent, so we don't have audio problems. Uh, so good morning to everyone. My name is Luca Belli. I'm a professor at FGV Law School, where I had the Center for Technology and Society. I had the privilege and honor to be one of the co-founders of this group that is now at its eighth uh, annual meeting, uh, quite an achievement. Uh, we, we have today a really an amazing set of panelists. I'm not going to present them all now because we have many, so we will present them as soon as we go with the flow of the session. Uh, let me just start with a couple of uh, words to uh, highlight why we are here this year, what we have been doing and what we do on a regular basis. So the goal of today's session is actually threefold. Uh, we are going to analyze some of the most pressing issues regarding uh, platform governance and platform responsibility, which is an, indeed a term that we created, we coined. Uh, it's a very hipster thing to say, but we were the ones creating the, the platform responsibility term eight years ago, actually almost nine years ago. Uh, so we are going to discuss some of the most pressing issues in this uh, growing area, uh, growing field of internet governance. We then we are going to focus into uh, the uh, one of the pressing uh, issues of uh, platform responsibility at this moment, which is uh, uh, platform uh, interoperability. Interoperability in general, but with regard to platforms in, in particular. And of course, the, the overarching goal of the session is also to launch the uh, glossary on platform law and policy terms, which is something, an outcome, a very concrete outcome that we have been working on. Uh, a good work, a good working group of this coalition uh, has been working on this for several years, uh, two years now. Uh, so it, we have, we presented a draft last year and uh, then we have been refining this with several consultations and we finally uh, have it today. So I will share this in the, the link in the, in the chat in a couple of minutes. Uh, but before uh, having this shared, let me just remind that the fundamental mission of this coalition is indeed to explore what are the elements of platform responsibility uh, in, interpreted as the digital platform responsibility to respect human rights. So we started this, the work of this coalition uh, in order to explore how to uh, make uh, digital platforms fit into the uh, overarching RAGI framework, the, the UN guiding principles of business and human rights. This then has been evolving uh, a lot over the past years. Uh, we have been issuing recommendations, best practices, several volumes, several research volumes. Uh, we have been uh, also uh, become in a, in a way victim of our success uh, and also victim you know, in a way of the platform success. Uh, we have, it is very clear and under the sight of everyone that at least some major platforms have achieved a uh, almost untenable uh, size. Uh, almost some people say too big to be regulated, but some others actually are uh, elaborating very concrete proposals to regulate them, and some others are already regulating them. So uh, this is a very interesting evolution, of, a very recent evolution. Uh, only until three years ago, it was uh, almost seen uh, as something uh, crazy to criticize uh, some of these very successful platforms. Nowadays, it's very evident that they need to be somehow uh, limited and regulated. We see very relevant uh, issues with regard to competition, not only in specific sectors like social media and search, but at the ecosystem, at the ecosystem level. So really ecosystem, entire private ecosystem that are created, where uh, that are organized by single 
uh, uh, platform providers and that can exclude or limit competition in the entire uh, internet. So this uh, uh, conversation has been going on for years now, and there has been a latent issue, a latent problem that we have decided to address two years ago, which is all this conversation have a, 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 a common problem. There is a, a difficulty in having a shared language, a shared terminology. So the, the last very important issue of today is representing this glossary that we have been elaborating over the past couple of years to offer guidance of a shared terminology. If you want to foster not only interoperability, but legal interoperability, uh, terminology, semantic interoperability, where people, uh, policymakers, researchers, uh, uh, private sector leaders can read uh, around the world, can read what specific terms mean, what is a platform, what is an aggregator, what is a uh, warning in a platform? Uh, what is a uh, priorization in a platform? Uh, what is pornography? I mean, there are a lot of terms that are utilized to regulate platforms with very difficult meanings. And what we've tried really hard to do with this glossary is also to convey this heterogeneity of significance, of conceptions, depending on the specific jurisdiction of the specific cultural uh, specificities, we have very different perception of the same thing. And we try to stress this, this heterogeneity, not to be prescriptive, but to provide a very ample, the, the widest possible uh, selection of, uh, of conceptions and conceptualization, so that th those who read this, we have 100 terms defined in this glossary, precisely to help policymakers, researchers understand well what we are speaking about. Now, to start this uh, conversation of today, we have two uh, keynote speakers. Uh, first, uh, my good friend, Patrick Penix, uh, that will start providing us some, uh, some, some uh, news about the uh, recent evolutions at the Council of Europe level. Then we will have a video from David Kay that unfortunately was not able to join us because in this moment in California, it's pretty late at night. Uh, so, and then I also would like to thank very much uh, Yasmin Kursi for all her work uh, in co-editing this, this book of this year with me and with Nicolas Gales, and also for co-moderating the session of today. So without further ado, please, Patrick, the floor is yours. Good morning, Professor Belli. Good morning, Luca. Uh, it's very nice to see you and to see uh, the participants as well. And uh, it uh, reminds me of uh, um, our first activities together already on the role of platforms and namely when we were you for the Council of Europe were analyzing the, um, the terms of reference of uh, a number of internet applications and how we work together on those issues. The framework of human rights as you are doing right now and uh, it reminds me also of the uh, wonderful IGF session we had in Brazil uh, a number of years ago in 2015 uh, where we could cooperate uh, very closely and why is that so important for the Council of Europe well first of all because your perspective that you uh, with which you look into uh, these elements are the same as the Council of Europe you look at those aspects in to which extent they will affect the rule of law, human rights, and our democratic societies. And that is the crucial part. And that's why I was also very honored to be able to, uh, even though it was only through a preface, uh, contribute uh, somehow uh, to the um, glossary. So thank you for inviting the Council of Europe uh, to this challenging discussion. Um, Luca, of course, I don't need to tell you that the Council of Europe is not a European Union and that we have now 47 member states on the European continent. It's an international organization uh, which was founded in the wake of World War II to exactly uphold human rights, democracy and the rule of law in Europe. And that's an ongoing discussion and that's an ongoing challenge, I would say. So what we do is creating and offering guidance to our member states and beyond 
to promote a number of standards on the basis of this human rights centered approach. Going back to today's discussion, the organization and Council of Europe is not necessarily dealing with the technical aspects of plat platform interoperability as much as with the ultimate product of such interoperability that needs to go to the benefits of all involved stakeholders while offering on the one side the necessary protection against the challenges and the digital sphere may pose and uh, combat uh, any possible misuses that may happen there. But we do agree uh, that the interoperability is crucial for the user's rights to be exercised in the online space. And this needs to go hand in hand with a human rights centered framework for the governance of the platforms and the responsibility they carry in this sense. At the Council of Europe, we particularly look at the impacts of the platforms and internet intermediaries on human rights, rule of law and democracy. And this is the perspective that I want to address in this session. So I will briefly go over what we believe are the main challenges of platform governance and how the Council of Europe is helping in addressing those. Digital platforms have become an important part of people's everyday information and com uh, communication activities. That goes without saying. They have also transformed individuals' media and news consumption habits, uh, offering obviously new opportunities in terms of accessing information, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, public debate and participation. But they also have gradually become almost indispensable for all sorts of different activities, commercial, cultural, social. And uh, in the past uh, two years uh, with the pandemic, obviously this brought it all and to forefront and more in evidence. So platforms have not only become powerful intermediaries between content producers and their audiences, but have also assumed a central position in the world economy, while the, the whole public sphere has gone through a profound uh, structural transformation. We meet each other online. We are in different parts of the world, can still directly communicate with each other. So these new powerful actors, the internet intermediaries, they come, they came to the position of prominence. And beyond the opportunities they offer, platforms pose those new challenges, not only for the realization of human rights and fundamental freedoms, uh, including the freedom of expression and information, the right to private life, protection of personal data, but also more and more so, in the functioning of our democratic societies. So the rise, of, the rise of digital technologies and the fast growing use of artificial intelligence systems put in front of us immense challenges that the health crisis has only exacerbated. Misinformation, hate speech, polarization of public opinion have never been so widespread and are hindering the necessary debates. Important maybe also for the audience is that the Council of Europe only last, just one week ago, adopted a number of uh, elements uh, of a legal framework on artificial intelligence that we intend to put into a, a global treaty, an international convention, and which tackles a number of the key debates that also concern platforms and network intermediaries. Now, uh, of course, all the activities of the platforms don't need to be demonized. A good example being all the activities which would have been impossible during a COVID-19 confinement and which were facilitated thanks to the digital technologies and platforms and obviously also the interoperability between them. In today's complex digital ecosystem, it is a shared responsibility of both the public and the private actors, and also the citizens, I would say, uh, to contribute to making full use of the benefits of such an innovation uh, through a human rights and rule of law centered approach. So the Council of Europe takes the rule of law approach to governance of online platforms and other intermediaries with self-regulation by internet intermediaries as an important complementary form of governance. For example, 
in 2018, our Committee of Ministers adopted a recommendation on the role and responsibility of internet intermediaries, which introduces a number of measures and procedural safeguards to mitigate the risk of illegal being spread online. And in this sense, provides a solid basis for national regulatory and co-regulatory frameworks. Another rule related to the AI systems used by the most platforms is the recommendation on human rights impacts of algorithmic systems. The guidelines of this document cover multiple aspects of the deployment of algorithmic systems, including data management, modeling and analysis, transparency, accountability, effective remedies, precautionary measures, and so on and so forth. So a series of other instruments focused on content moderation or addressing the hate speech online have also been used and are still currently under, under work, actually. Uh, today, as we are speaking, we have one of our steering committees or two of our steering committees working on hate speech, a new definition of hate speech and how it can be operationalized. So an important dimension, of course, is a constructive, open, inclusive, multi-stakeholder approach. We don't want to demonize intermediaries. We want to find effective and sustainable solutions. Council of Europe has been cooperating very closely with civil society for a while, but we now also do so with, uh, with the business sector, including the big uh, multinational companies which are active in that field. So in following multilateral consultations, um, uh, the Council of Europe Secretary General signed an agreement, an exchange of letters since 2017 with um, leading technology firms and associations, uh, enabling their representatives to sit side by side with governments and civil society when shaping policies related to digital technologies. So last uh, but not least, I would say the responsibility is also with the civil society and the internet users themselves. What we can do on this and have been doing at the Council of Europe is, no, is to systematically integrate media and information literacy programs and perspectives in our standard setting instruments. Media and information literacy is relevant to exercise individuals' human rights online uh, and we need to be able to uh, continue this. So to conclude, uh, for the benefit of technology to reach out to all, the interoperability should not be only among digital platforms, but also among the involved stakeholders with the rights of the users, their human rights in particular, always at the center of our attention. And that's why we are very much interested to engage in further dialogue also with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick, uh, for writing the preface of our book and also for kicking off this presentation by giving us so much to think about. Uh, now I'd like to give the floor for the other keynote speaker, uh, David Kay, to give the floor. <laughs> Uh, who has sent us a video because he's unable to join us today. Uh, please, Walter, could you share it? Good morning. I'm sorry not to be able to join you all in person. I, like you, have been hoping and planning for so long to be together for this panel in Poland, and I hope we can have this conversation together in the near future. So uh, I'm David Kay. I teach law at the University of California at Irvine, and I served as the UN's Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression from 2014 to 2020. During this time, interoperability has slowly become one of the dominant ideas to solve today's malaise around the internet. It's dominance by major platforms and the resulting vulnerability to pressure, to privacy interference and censorship by governments. It's tempting for me to simply use these few minutes really just to recite the works of key thinkers in the space of policy and technology, people like Daphne Keller, Mike Masnick, Ian Brown, the folks at EFF, and the smart people on this panel. Instead, I'm just going to say a few high-level things, 
more as questions than as answers, and with the hope to simply lay out what I think are a few ways forward, particularly with the European Digital Markets Act pending and a major source of discussion clearly ahead of us in 2022. This discussion is vital, and I'm so glad that Yasmin and Luca and their colleagues have initiated it here uh, at IGF. So first, what are the things that we value for the future of the internet and does interoperability promote them? I think that's where we start with this conversation. And those things are values that we've been talking about in IGF and in other forums for years. An internet that is open, that's secure, that is competitive, and perhaps most importantly, that is democratic, rights enabling, and promoting of user choice. So how does interoperability play into these values? First, individual choice and control. It allows one to move around, to choose viable services for one's own purposes, to avoid the walled gardens that have arisen in the past 15 years. It enables new market entrants, plugs in new approaches in a way that could enable the development of innovative technologies and business models. It promotes multiple avenues of expression. And this might not be evident on the surface, but for this purpose, I really just wanna quote a, a piece from Mike Masnick that was published by the Knight uh, Institute at Columbia uh, some time ago. And he said this, and I'm quoting, rather than relying on a few giant platforms to police speech online, there could be widespread competition in which anyone could design their own interfaces, filters, and additional services, allowing whichever ones work best to succeed without having to resort to outright censorship for certain voices. It would allow end users to determine their own tolerances for different types of speech, but make it much easier for most people to avoid the most problematic speech without silencing anyone entirely or having the platforms themselves make the decisions about who is allowed to speak. And I end the quote there. So that's a very good and open argument in favor of interoperability from the perspective of speech. And finally, interoperability undermines uniform control and undermines one-stop shopping for government censorship for, as we've seen over the last several years, the dominance of platforms has been a boon to governments that seek to undermine freedom of expression. So these are all true, I think, in principle. Success will rely on a few things. Of course, as many have pointed out, this isn't the case right now where we have strong regulation, even in regimes like the GDPR that promote interoperability, and that needs to change, likely in the context, or at least hopefully in the context, of the DMA. We're also going to need clarity in the rules and certainty in their enforcement, something that we haven't really seen to date. We also need to be alive to the fact that any policy will involve trade offs. And Daphne Keller has made this point really well when she asked earlier this year in the case of privacy when a user opts into a new service, can she give that service permission to process other people's data and content? The technology to solve these problems is not always understood by policymakers, by lawyers, certainly not by me, and we need to factor that into our discussions. But the urge to enable more communication according to user autonomy is one that interoperability speaks to. So and thank you very much, Victoria, for having helped us coordinate during this uh, unusual moment. No problem. Let's see if we can manage to proceed. Uh, I, I mean, today I wanted to just give a recap of what's happening in Europe around the interoperability, because I, I guess that many people could already know, but maybe not everyone, not the people from around the world. You, you might have heard that the European Union has been working on new regulation for platforms. Uh, it's a very broad effort uh, that consists of several acts. Uh, the one that mostly focuses on interoperability is the Digital Markets Act, which is the one that also focuses more on competition and antitrust and trying to resume and restore some uh, choice for users over the internet. 
Um, it's interesting to note that uh, interoperability has been proposed in several forms uh, from, from, I mean, for a long time, but in the initial proposal by the Commission, there was not a, a lot of it. Actually, the, the only interoperability requirement that was added into the text, into the original proposal by the Commission, was only for ancillary services, so stuff like payments, identification, delivery, advertising, but not for the actual core platform services like um, social media, messaging, search, video sharing. And, and it was only for business users. So th th there seems to be this idea that this is only something that's good for business and not uh, a basic principle of the internet. So the first comment I really like to make, and I think we should always, uh, all, always remember, is that interoperability is, is a basic architectural principle of the internet. It's not a, an add-on. It's not something uh, you, you, you only use in certain situations when you really need to do something. It is uh, something that, that is actually foreseen in all the architectural documents from the internet. Uh, let's say from the 80s, 90s, the, the age in which the internet started to become the, the, the thing we know today and, and the email and the web were invented. Uh, this, I mean, email and the web, and the web are actually the, the, the best example of interoperable services that, that actually uh, I mean, have succeeded, have, have created uh, growth and services for everyone and have contributed to the success of the internet. And they are open and federated because they are based on interoperability. You can actually get your email address from whoever you want and communicate with uh, any other email user from other providers. And thanks to the fact that there are open standards and all providers accept messages from users of the other providers. This is not what has been happening in the last, uh, in the, in the last uh, 10, 15 years with this new wave of services that are built as world gardens like instant messaging and social media, these are the best events, but pretty much everything that's been done, even mobile operating systems are actually built in the, as silos, as world gardens. And, uh, and there's, uh, it's a, there's a hard time, for example, to, to use a search engine or, or an email app or something, I mean, different from the one that is provided by the, the provider of the operating system. Sometimes it's impossible, sometimes this is just a matter of defaults, and there's really no reason for that. So. So we should really recognize that interoperability is a basic principle and should apply in general to all internet services to keep the internet open and, and not fragmented and all these nice things that we keep hearing. And uh, so I mean, there has been a template during the last year to uh, strengthen the interoperability requirements that were proposed by the European Commission in the, in the initial draft. And this has uh, brought some fruits. I mean, we will see next week when the European Parliament votes the, the text uh, in the first reading, but there have been some substantial additions uh, about around interoperability. Uh, so now, uh, I mean, the, apart from the original principle, which has also been extended to mobile operating systems and um, in general to users, uh, that there are two specific requirements, one for social media and one for instant messaging that are also requiring dominant platforms. So not, not everyone, not each and every social media starter, but the dominant ones, and we, we all know what they are, to, to open up the uh, interfaces and to use open standards to interoperate with third parties. So the idea is that we could break the, the wall gardens, for example, in the instant messaging sphere by allowing uh, third parties to develop clients that can exchange uh, uh, messages with uh, with users of the dominant platform like WhatsApp. So I could have a, a, an application which allows me to send messages to, to users of WhatsApp, but maybe also to users of Telegram and Signal. And, and maybe finally I can only have one application rather than having to have five, six applications that basically differ just for the color or the user interface and for the rest they are all the same. And I think this is, by the, by the way, this is also an advantage in usability. It is an advantage, uh, an environmental advantage, because uh, if, if you have less applications open, you use less resources, you can use older devices without them breaking up and so on. So it's uh, so the, 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 the newer version is better uh, and we hope we escape, but we are still not there. So the, 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 the thing I really wanted to say is that Again, we, we should introduce interoperability as an architectural principle, which is upheld, uh, upheld by the law, so that uh, all dominant services are required to have it in all core platform services. Uh, and it should not be considered as an ad hoc thing. So th this adding of more and more uh, commas in the law that, uh, I mean, uh, introduce interoperability in, in one slightly different from than, than, than uh, for, for another service. So service by service, service in, in slightly different forms. 
it's creating maybe it's a, it's a step forward, but it's creating maybe also problems of interoperability between the different interoperabilities and compatibility. So we should really try to get to have a, a broad approach to the problem and not just a, try to, to solve one market at a time. And this is also necessary to make uh, legislation future proof because today maybe the key service is social media. Maybe in five years from now, it will be something different. We will all be exchanging information and in uh, news and through other means. So uh, we, we need to make this a principle in general for any kind of service that serves the, the broad majority of internet users and goes beyond certain uh, revenue thresholds. So I would stop here for the moment and I'm happy to hear uh, other opinions on this. Thank you very much, Victoria, also for highlighting that we, uh, the issue is not, uh, it's not any more uh, related exclusively to specific sectors, but it's an, an ecosystemic issue. And uh, I'm, I'm doing some work with uh, Ian Brown that you know very well, and also my, my colleague, uh, Nicole Zingales, that today unfortunately cannot be with us about really a competition in ecosystem, in digital ecosystems. We are analyzing the BRICS countries, so an unusual grouping that is not really the most uh, discussed uh, uh, grouping of countries, uh, but it's very prominent, uh, especially some of them, India, China, and Russia, to some extent, and Brazil. Uh, but, uh, and, and we really are tackling this. We are analyzing this competition in digital ecosystems, precisely. We are not anymore into specific sectors, but in vertically integrated ecosystems that uh, may lock out competitors and lock in users as you were pointing out, and this really demands specific policies. And it's really a question of internet openness, as we also were discussing a couple of days ago in another session. Uh, now, let me, uh, I don't see uh, Catherine here uh, yet. So I'm not sure if she managed to connect uh, again after the uh, unfortunate episode we had some minutes ago. So I would like to give the floor now to Rolf Weber, Professor Rolf Weber from the University of Zurich that has been also a, a, a core pillar of the work of the Dynamic College for Platform Responsibility over the past years. So please, Rolf, the floor is yours. Um, hello, uh, Luca, nice to hear you. Uh, can you understand me? Because at least uh, my picture uh, seems to have blocked by the organizer, but um, I'm can not we sure. Ask, I can we, we, can hear, we can hear you. I would like to ask the, organ, the, the technical support to enable also the video of Rolf Weber. Well, uh, I'm not so attractive, uh, so that's not really uh, important and we know each other. You're, a, you're very charming, Rolf, you're very charming. <laughs> if we can have I, I try to be um, really short and I would like to go a little bit back uh, somehow to the roots of the glossary, not quoting what has been said in the glossary, but um, as a lawyer and as a law professor, I, of course, put always emphasis on uh, terminological perspectives. And if we have the term interoperability, then we should be aware of the fact that many different uh, uh, kinds of interoperability must be uh, distinguished. And I would like uh, to mention four groups. First of all, if you look at the EU report, at the so-called Westerger um, report, then we see a distinction between protocol interoperability, which allows service to function at a basic level or a sophisticated level, and data interoperability, which also allows the sharing of data. Then from a more economic uh, perspective, we can distinguish between direct network effects, uh, i.e. the between platform interoperability that eliminates proprietary direct network um, effects and opens the network to entry and the indirect network effects, which erode the platform's proprietary effects, enabling business users and end consumers to freely choose among the multiple functional complements. As a third uh, group, uh, I would uh, like to address vertical interoperability and horizontal uh, interoperability. The vertical interoperability refers to the ability of digital services to incorporate data content or functionality from an upstream provider and the horizontal interoperability refers to the ability of digital services to communicate with real services. And finally, the last uh, group, uh, 
would uh, have to address the distinction between the technical interoperability, which uh, is uh, probably the key issue of most regulations, and the legal interoperability. And for the last uh, 10 years, we were in fact discussing more intensively also um, legal interoperability, which uh, addresses uh, the fact that uh, different legal frameworks uh, cannot be uh, compliant. And as a consequence, we do have contradictory um, legal rules. And if you take this whole picture, and my uh, time uh, is uh, almost up, but fortunately the EU um, framework has already been discussed uh, very nicely by the last uh, speaker. I would like uh, somehow to plead to an additional, to implement an additional um, uh, notion, namely the notion um, of equitable uh, interoperability, uh, which should carefully be um, implemented as a means uh, into the existing regulations that would, by the way, also go further, in my opinion, than the DMA and to uh, complement the DSA in the European Union, the Digital Services um, Act. I would uh, propose that it should be possible to identify settings where equitable interoperability is needed to create an interface with application programming interfaces that promote competition in the market. Uh, it should uh, possibly be a, a solution to issue licenses to parties that wish to interoperate. The regulator should halt changes to the standards if they are anti-competitive. And finally, interoperability standards should be strongly enforced. I know that uh, the pocket is now um, relatively rich, but there would be uh, ample ground to further discuss interoperability issues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Rolf. Uh, now I'm going to pass the, to give the floor for my colleague, uh, Smriti Panshira from the Cyberbrick, uh, fellow from the Cyberbricks project. Smriti, are you here with us? Um, I don't know if she has the permissions to talk. Not able to unmute. Uh, please, uh, the host can can enable Smriti's microphone and video. Is the host here with us? Okay, I am unmuted. I can't start the video, but I think let's just get started. Thank you, Luca and Yasmin. Sorry that you're going through this um, I'm sorry. episode. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll just jump straight in to add to the discussions we've heard so far to talk a little bit about uh, the Indian experience. Uh, and we have, of course, been ha uh, having a lot of discussions from the competition perspective in India, from a data protection perspective. But what I thought I'll focus on today is a discussion that's going on and some implementation that's going on in terms of uh, in technical standards for interoperability, specifically, uh, you know, the project that I'm referring to is called the Data Empowerment and Protection Architecture that has been adopted in India uh, currently in two sectors, in the financial services sector and in the health management sector. It's, uh, in the process of being adopted. And the idea uh, of this whole ecosystem is to try and use a standardized consent artifact, which is basically a technical artifact that's going to record uh, you know, when someone is giving consent to whom, for what specific purpose, for what duration, and to enable the use of this particular artifact to, uh, you know, through standardized APIs to enable data sharing. And the idea behind this is, of course, to kind of walk the talk on uh, requirements like consent management and notice and consent, data portability, interoperability, which form a part of most data protection regimes, uh, but to enable, you know, the background technical architecture in a way for that to happen. 
and uh, I'm not going to try sharing my screen, but basically uh, the example, if I could illustrate it in words, is that uh, you know, if on one side of it, you think about entities like an insurance company, like a credit company, which wants data about an individual in order to serve them. And on the other side, you have entities like banks, which currently have this data. Uh, the idea of this whole architecture is to have intermediaries in the middle called consent managers, which will, based on the consent given by the individual through this artifact, transfer data from one entity to the other while themselves remaining blind to the data. So the data will be transferred in an encrypted format. Uh, so the intermediary doesn't see the data themselves, but is able to maintain an auditable trail of the whole uh, transaction. And, uh, you know, this is, of course, important in terms of actually operationalizing interoperability, because if we want to see data transfer taking place, data sharing taking place, and you know this falls in the domain of what Professor just described as the data interoperability. So it's not protocol and uh, direct interoperability between the platforms, but it's interoperability in terms of the sharing and enabling that sharing of data. And uh, so it's clear that it's, a, it's an important goal to be achieving, and it's an, you know, a legitimate uh, technical step towards achieving that goal, but there are a couple of issues that I just did, wanted to highlight in terms of the design of this specific project and bigger questions that that leads to in terms of when we think about standards for interoperability. The first, you know, the example of the issue is around the central planning in this whole model, where that you have one entity which is now being endorsed by the government in many sectors, which is taking up this work of formulating these standards, as opposed to multiple standards coming up in a collaborative. Um, you know, manner from within the industry through, through like you see in a lot of other standard making bodies. So the fact that this is some sort of a central planned uh, implementation of standard does lead to questions about, you know, long term innovation, long term competition, long term business models, because it's not necessary. This is the best or the most efficient way of doing uh, consent and interoperability. So it is likely that more models would have come up if this were not a centrally controlled mechanism. Uh, the other question, of course, is about the platform which will have the power to create these standards and uh, you know, monitor the enforcement, then that leads to certain problems of a new kind of category of a new big tech platform being created in order to counter the dominance of existing big tech, there is a possibility that we are creating a new uh, standard making body, which becomes a big tech in the process. And the last, you know, sort of slightly provocative question I wanted to raise is around the, the philosophy that, you know, is going behind this kind of data sharing and data improvement interoperability because it's coming from a place where we are recognizing data to be a valuable resource and we are saying you know it shouldn't be locked in silos more people should be able to access it build upon it etc and of course this is really important from a competition and innovation point of view but from a rights protection point of view you know there is scope for some debate about whether it is you know, inherently good for people where business models are nudged in a direction where more and more data sharing becomes possible. And we are actually facilitating more data sharing by telling people that, you know, now this data is not locked in silos and even you should come and build models which take on more and more personal data and utilize that. And whether that's, you know, really necessarily good for uh, users in the long run, because perhaps having less data about yourself shared and out there is in a way also empowering. So I just wanted to end on that note. And back to you, Yasmin and Luca. Thank you very much, Smriti. And indeed, it's pretty interesting to see the Indian example and how India is strategizing, not only and already implementing to some extent that strategy, uh, considering uh, really data as a uh, relevant national asset and also the technology providing open APIs to uh, uh, allow a sort of technical interoperability proposed and promoted by the state itself. Uh, this is not always playing well, but there is a clear intention to go into this direction and not only to elaborate policy. What I really liked about the Indian example, the Indian case that you are bringing here, that we are discussing within the CyberBricks project is, is really the fact that India is not only about legislation or regulatory authorities, but it's also creating technology that can enable this interoperability, which is a pretty interesting example to, to discuss. Now, uh, let me uh, give the floor to the next speaker, which is, uh, who is Alejandro Pisanti uh, from the uh, Autonomous University of Mexico. Uh, Alejandro has been also working with us for many years and has some very interesting proposals about uh, uh, 
platform uh, interoperability and federation of, of platforms. So please, Alejandro, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luca. Uh, congratulations for putting together this meeting today. And uh, especially congratulations for uh, the great work you have done uh, dealing with the incident, which was very unpleasant, but you managed to recover very fast. Uh, congratulations, Yasmin and the technical team in, uh, in Getulio and, uh, and of course in, in the IGF. Uh, I am a little bit skeptical about uh, calls for interoperability. Uh, I, I think that the approach that has been described from India by Smiti Pashira is, uh, is very promising uh, for new services, but it's very hard to make interoperability do the work that we think it will do uh, with existing platforms. Uh, many other initiatives like data portability, data trusts, and so forth focus on the data. But the value is in the relationships and in the analytics uh, deriving from, from, the, from the networks. So that's going to be much harder to, to, to reap the benefits that are expected. Uh, I, I have, a, as you know, Luca, a scheme where I would uh, see, I would uh, make all, all, all these proposals cross this seed uh, to see how they can work. It has six factors, which are the internet scale, which includes networking effects, and of course, the speed of the internet. So if you have a proposal, you have to check whether it scales to internet scale and it moves at internet speed. And that may not work. If you just ask, let's say, Facebook to open up their data, you still may not get a, a new network that, uh, that, that does, that, that makes people happy. And I, I, I use this very vaguely. Second factor is identity management and anonymity, of course, pseudonymity and all the degrees that we have been introduced into identity. The third factor is trans jurisdictional factors, and that has been mentioned very much by Patrick and by, by uh, uh, Rolf, which is whether your proposal will actually pass legal interoperability. That's my trans jurisdictional factor, whether it actually is legal or it may be paralegal, not legal, or illegal against the law in some countries, what you're doing. Uh, and then you have uh, barrier lowering which means the lowering the barriers for entry into markets or for creating a new business. You have friction reduction, which is not always desirable. That's uh, the cost of some evils like Zoom bombing, for example, because it's just too easy to do some things, but you want to manage friction. And the last one is memory and oblivion or forgetting. So we will have to see this interoperability proposal to see how well they react to these six factors. And some of them may actually die by before, before you are done with the first line, some of them may get to the fifth line and you may see how you could manage to, to get them to work. That's number one part of my intervention as planned. And uh, the second one is that there's, uh, going to the, to the general uh, topic of platform responsibility, we have now uh, in, in the field of content moderation, but other aspects of platform responsibility as well, like uh, cloud security and so forth, uh, we are beginning to see the construction of entities like the Facebook Content Oversight Board, which is a quasi-judicial uh, entity with some powers over Facebook. We see that TikTok has established several safety councils. Uh, they're not exactly doing the same thing. They're not oriented to the same thing. Twitter has not opened up their councils, but they have invited people to uh, uh, work with their policies. They are very different companies. They are very different services, despite some superficial or general similarity. As soon as you dig into the details, they are very different. But we're beginning to see this multi-stakeholder approach uh, endorsed and applied by some of these very, very big actors. Uh, some of them are more open doors, some more closed. They are calling on people who come from a very, uh, let's say, not narrow, but not extremely large pool of expertise. So there are some names of people who are being members of the Facebook Oversight Board who you would surely call to help you with TikTok or to take part in, uh, in Twitter because of their known commitment to the interface between internet and technology and uh, internet technology and society and uh, their legal expertise, maturity and so forth. So my proposal, as you mentioned, Luca, is that we begin convening meetings informally between the people who are members of these organizations. They will be constrained about what they can say because they have signed non-disclosure agreements, they have ethical commitments 
tool secrecy uh, uh, for, for the things they're they are dealing with. They have private information from the companies which they cannot reveal, but there still is a lot of uh, issues that which they can talk about in the open. And we should begin not to look for a coordination, certainly not to look for an, an over board, the board of all boards or a formal federation, but uh, an informal exchange of knowledge uh, would help everybody here would make more public what are the really pressing needs the users perceive what are the really hurting uh, legal risks where lives are and, and uh, reputations and uh, heritages are at stake uh, and uh, also uh, this would fit in a strategic moment i think that the this market let's say or this field of uh, social media platforms etc uh, is uh, ripe for uh, 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 a pivotal moment where the, these large companies, these large actors, uh, start getting their act together with civil society, the technical community, and governments, uh, and start a scheme, uh, as was proposed by Patrick Penix, where the, everybody has a say, uh, everybody assumes some responsibility, but we stop seeing uh, this pendular movement, where originally the social media companies, for example, were becoming the arbiters of free speech. Now they don't want to be the arbiters of free speech. They have realized that this is not desirable, not only because people from the militant human rights side have said, we don't want X or Y company to be the arbiter of what is free speech, what can be said and what not. But they're asking for governments or intergovernmental agreements to establish the rules in a top-down way so that they can just comply or not comply with these rules. And they can expel a user saying, well, you violated the law from one uh, country, so you're out of all the countries. Uh, so to finalize, this is a moment where, uh, let's say, the large chemical and energy companies were here uh, 70 years ago when environmental regulations began to be promoted, when people started protesting against uh, air pollution, water pollution, soil pollution. Uh, these companies, uh, like the tobacco industry before, first denied there was a problem, and then they said it was a minor problem, and then they said it was for them to solve. And then when they realized that there, in, in many countries like Brazil, Mexico, and of course, Europe and the US, people were starting to promote very hard legislation. They tried to capture the legislative process and the, the environmental regulation. So we're at a moment like that with these companies. And we should make use of this century of experience of fields becoming regulated uh, and not let this become a company to government thing, but make this a full society and with a lot of technical knowledge in view. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Pizanti. Um, it's my great pleasure to present now Nina da Hora, or Nina of the Hour, <laughs> my colleague and researcher at the CTS, uh, and also a member of the TikTok Security Council in Brazil. Uh, I would also like to apologize once again for this incident that we suffered here uh, and that any other inconvenience that it might be causing to you. Uh, if you, the organization would like to know how to avoid these incidents in the future, you should call so Nina for tips and advice. So thanks, uh, Nina, the floor is yours. Thanks, Yasmin and Luca. Uh, it's a pleasure to be participating with you. Um, for me, it's okay. These, these attacks uh, happened a lot last year. And I think we have, we can think about the protocols uh, for, for control this in big events. So for me, it's normal, this, this inconvenience. Uh, but for this, this session, uh, I prepare some points about content moderation across platform. But first, uh, I want to remember uh, how, how, how we use it forums uh, on platform. Um, that, that had specific terms. Uh, remember about uh, your good, the community in, in on the good or good uh, communities about movies, communities about about games. Uh, in this community, the users uh, use it to apply for for being a moderator. 
uh, was a voluntary, a voluntary action. And after some years uh, with Facebook, uh, I think uh, this, this, this process changed. No, isn't it voluntary? It's about uh, teams and some people, uh, some people choose it for someone to control and moderate information about us. So uh, when when I remember this, I think in, in that in that moment, well, uh, we we had many problems, many social problems, races, um, homophobic, and the others on the other social problems. But in in the in the in the others in the others, um, I forget the word. It's about. Today we have the same problem, but it's a in slight dissemination. And the many, many people organized the, these attacks. In the other years, we had it is the same social problems, but the people doesn't, uh, didn't organize it in, in, in different countries. Uh, was a specific, specific groups, specific things, specific people. And today is everyone um, uh, is everyone with these attacks. So I think about regulations. Uh, in my view, uh, had uh, had a big problem because we don't know we don't know about the bias biases uh, behind this platform, and the biases is from is from people. It's from, uh, it's, it's from us. So the process is opaque and the regulations for this is, 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 uh, is very, it's very difficult because it doesn't consider this bias. So I think in, uh, the, 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 first the first thing is, is this context. Uh, who is the people or who control who who created this technology and this process about moderation the other the other point is about uh, they must include uh, greater or different transparency about this process transparency about the code but transparency about the team that moderated this this content and we 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 doesn't we doesn't have this information for for in my point of view for the regulation we need this information because it do, doesn't make sense regulation for uh, opaque process and the other point is about a participation uh, participation by civil society and people commonly attacked, like uh, or such as journalists, scientists, teachers. Here in Brazil, we increasingly, uh, we, we, we live in, in, a, in a constantly attacks uh, for, for these people. And I think this, this, this uh, specific, this specific, um, Professionals uh, have we, have we participated about this. This is a regulation in this debate. Is this not is is this not not is doesn't a problem for uh, for just organization or or people that work with justice is a problem for everyone. And I think in, in specific journalists here in Brazil. I'm worried about it for, for the next year because the content from journalists and the other, and the other journals here in Brazil uh, is, is constantly attacked on social platforms and the, the moderator uh, doesn't have a, a truly approach for, for this. So this is my point of view from Brazil about uh, these complex themes. Thanks, people. Thank you very much, Nina. Uh, thank you very much also for reminding us that the need for involving the people that frequently are victim of these attacks, uh, 
also thank you for stressing that actually this kind of accident we experience today it's uh, sadly something very common uh, and uh, we should really need to uh, have uh, a uh, more efficient effective approach to tackling these challenges uh, the, the hosts are, uh, are just told us that they are very kindly allowing us to have 10 extra minutes to finalize the session and to recover a little bit of the time we lost uh, at the beginning due to the uh, Zoom bombing accident. So I would like to open the floor now to have a final 10 minutes of uh, open debate amongst us. Uh, I know that Patrick had a, com a comment or a question that he wanted to share. He was uh, telling uh, this on the chat. So Patrick, please, uh, if you want to share your question or comment, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, Luca, um, I can't share my screen, but that doesn't matter anymore. Uh, I think it's important that um, that we can hear each other. And thank you so much for organizing this Zoom bombing as an experience for us all. Um, I, I just wanted to, uh, to react to Alejandro um, because it raised a question to me. And that question is, and it's a question for everyone. And it's not a question about crying over spilled milk, but it's more a question of how we've, we've proned an open internet uh, for the first 10, 12 years of the uh, IGF, right? Um, I think that was fundamental to, uh, to the internet governance. Um, we do, however, now see that it is very difficult to rein in some of the liberties that we have been able to give, basically. And that has led in the Council of Europe to the reflection, not, not as I said, not to cry over spilled milk, because that's past. But it is difficult afterwards to set beacons and boundaries. And that's why we have gone ahead uh, in terms of artificial intelligence right now to establish to to start establishing a legal framework and probably leading up to a, a global convention or at least a convention which is stimulated by the council of europe such as the cybercrime convention or the data protection convention 108 in order to set the boundaries and i think it is important to set these boundaries up front because it's afterwards far more difficult to streamline them uh, once uh, let's say the the ghost is out of the bottle thank you maybe we can have a quick reaction from alejandro that raised his hand and then vittorio also has a hand raised thank you yes very briefly the the price of uh we pay for for getting all those freedom for ourselves is that we give this freedom to everyone else and it's, uh, we, we, we're not always happy with what people do with their freedom. Uh, I think that many of the issues that we want to fix, uh, we can only partially fix with uh, the internet. And that includes uh, these uh, new rulings for intelli artificial intelligence. Uh, a lot of the evil that happens, happens by, 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 by humans on the edge. I mean, the Zoom bombing is not an automatic thing. It was uh, someone trying to do something, trying to disrupt something for some human motive. We can use tools to try to uh, filter that out, but until we fix the minds, we're not going to fix the, the, the world. Uh, actually, what the internet does is it gives us more transparency. And I do invite you to look at the new coming regulations through my six factor tool. Uh, I think it's a, it, it, it helps shape regulations in ways that are more realistic. Think like that, like an attacker to be a good defender. Think what people are going to do abusing your rules and uh, filter it through these six uh, factors or the five factors in the internet toolkit, in the internet uh, assessment toolkit from ISOC, something like that, that tells you, are you not tearing the internet apart or not just wasting your time because you're trying to stop hurricanes with uh, wire uh, fences. Thank you. And thank you, Luca and Yasmin, and you should not apologize, Yasmin, for anything. You actually survived an incident, so you, you, can, you can add that into your curriculum right now. Thank you, Alejandro. Let's have Vittorio's comments and then uh, let's comment on this. 
Yes, well, my comments were also on this line. So, I mean, since um, with people like Alejandro, like many others, we, we shared uh, efforts for over 20 years now to defend the open multi-stakeholder governance of the internet, the idea of a global unfragmented internet and so on. So it, it came to me at least as a bit of a shock in, in the last few years that the realization that maybe every now and then we do need the regulation and quite hard regulation. And so I, I think that as an internet community, we do have to do some thinking and understand where we are because uh, when we continue to advocate uh, the open global and unfragmented internet, I, I am all in favor if we refer to a global ability to communicate, to work with each other, to exchange data and information and services, uh, that, that's fine. I become a little more nervous now if, if uh, that, that extends to let's not make regulation and let's still keep governments out of the internet. That kind of mindset is still very, very strong in the internet's uh, technical circles especially in standardization places like the ITF, W3C, I mean, in, in, in also in, let's say, the Silicon Valley community. Uh, I think that we, we have come to realize that there is no freedom without rules. This is a basic fact that we should know from our offline world. But even in the online world, I think we, we now have to realize that we actually need regulation to preserve the openness of the internet. The point is which regulation and how do we get the good one and, and reject the, the wrong one that the attempts to close down the freedoms that we have, which is not really what we want. So, so perhaps, I mean, interoperability is, is one example, but there, there are, I mean, also the content issues are, are a bit about this. The, we, we have to realize that uh, there is the need for some so a, a little extent of sovereignty and regulation over the internet. And maybe what we should do as a community is to have a proposal to make this in a good way, which doesn't break all the rest of the internet, but still ensures that uh, each sovereign democratic state can set rules and we can defend the, the, the freedom and competition and the choice for users over the internet from consolidation and from the, the hands of very few global powerful companies, which I mean, they've also been doing pretty good stuff for everyone, but it's not the model we, we want to go. It's not the original model of the internet. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria, for these comments. I actually had a couple of comments on top of your comments, uh, which is, uh, first of all, I think that uh, if we look at what we have been doing with this uh, book, it is quite pretty obvious that uh, what, we, what we are trying to do is laying the, the ground for then having some sort of interoperable, uh, legal interoperability or semantic interoperability so that those that want to regulate, and indeed it is necessary, we have reached a point when, where we cannot deny anymore that regulation is needed, is needed to, uh, to have to define the boundaries of what is the behavior that we want, that we wish to have on an open, secure, trusted, as the initial video of the IGF reminded us, a digital ecosystem. But then another thing that I really liked in, Victor, in Victoria's comment is that uh, it is not tenable anymore the, the, the thesis that governments should not regulate the internet. Uh, this is not tenable anymore. Uh, I mean, since the, the times of the Romans, for those of us that have studied law, we know that there is this principle of uh, ubi societas ibi use. So where there is a society, there is there are rules. This means that if they are not made by the government, by the public sector, it will be made privately by the private sector. And that is precisely what we have on, mainly online in this moment over the past uh, decades or we or two decades mainly, we have witnessed the emergence of uh, technology behemoths that have also become private regulators. This is something that we started uh, describing in this very coalition five years ago. We had published about this. We have uh, we have been speaking about this. And it's on the one hand very reassuring to you that now this is something that most of people are realizing. On the other hand, it's a little bit scary to understand that uh, we don't know yet how to do this, how to regulate properly. And that regulation is still very fragmented with very different diverging sometimes uh, 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 initiatives. It's very good to see, for instance, what Patrick was mentioning about the Council of Europe, again, taking a leading role, trying to lead in the definition of, uh, of uh, core principles had, as you did 
uh, 40 years ago with the Convention 108 and then with the Budapest Convention that then became a global benchmark, even if they were uh, elaborated at a European level, uh, it would be interesting to have a very a re global uh, in initiative in this sense, but it's very ambitious as a plan. It's very difficult to realize. I'm a very pragmatic person, as all of you know, and I know that this kind, having a consensus on this kind of issues globally is extraordinarily difficult. Already when we have, when we are only five people in a room is already very difficult. When we have 193 countries in the room, uh, it's almost impossible. So we have a lot of work still to do, and it's very interesting to see the kind of of uh, uh, policy initiatives that are emerging, especially at the European level. But I, I'm, as you know, I really have an interest, a concrete interest also in the BRICS countries. And I see what is emerging from the Chinese at the Chinese or Indian level, also very interesting to analyze. And it really uh, is, uh, uh, it, worth, it is really worth uh, paying more attention to what also those uh, gi giant countries are trying to elaborate and are putting in place in this moment. Now, I see that it's already 43. Uh, so I, if there is any final remark from our speakers that I really thank uh, again very much for the excellent presentations, that is the time to speak. If, if anyone wants to, I see Alejandro for, for a final comment. Please, Alejandro, go ahead. Very briefly, just uh, I don't disagree with you on the need uh, for some behaviors to be regulated. They actually, everything that happens on the internet happens somewhere and someone may be breaking the law somewhere uh, without realizing and so forth. We should just, we should just be sure that we don't try to regulate the internet in one way as a whole. We remember the many different layers and the focus on conduct and of course uh, and, and system and doing it in, on, on a way that fits the internet, not trying to fit the internet into something that it will just escape through the, the whole. Indeed, the, I mean the problem of regulating is that then you have to be good quality regulation and not just regulation, otherwise it's counterproductive. Not the same thing to regulate Facebook and to regulate the technical standards. There are Indeed. Much, Indeed. much more human conduct values and diversity both as people to the upper leaves. With this uh, injection of pragmatism and uh, to some extent also optimism, I would like to uh, thank everyone and also thank the, the, the technical support for having helped us dealing with uh, what we have experienced and also for their flexibility giving us uh, 10 extra minutes to finalize. Thank you very much to everyone. Please uh, download from the IGF website the glossary, share it. I will share it with all of you in a, uh, by the end of the day. Thank you very much and see you next year. Bye-bye.